Well, good morning, folks. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Just waiting for, Wait for a latency test here. I can hear myself already, so it's pretty, it's pretty quick. I'm not going to mess around with that headset this morning because uh, it's failed me multiple times, so. So, uh, I should be safe today. Uh, I'm working with one OBS issue, not issue, but uh, one of the, the things that causes me or has caused me on two different occasions to lose audio uh, because I'm a complete noob with OBS. The scene feature that you use that like capture the charts or capture your screen or whatever, uh, some of them I did not actually assign a audio input capture. So when I switched charts in the past, uh, it caused me to lose the audio and I talked for like two hours. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to try to prevent that from happening by only having one scene, which I know has audio coming into it now. So I know some of you are probably going to say the audio sounds like crap. That's because I'm only using the internal microphone because as I mentioned, uh, I tried to use this headset, which I paid a pretty good amount of money for, not a lot, but I bought the highest end I could. And for whatever reason, it, it didn't work for me. So um, I will be shopping for a better microphone, I'm certain. But this is good enough. You guys can hear me. So before we get into it, just know that today I will be doing one of three baseline measurements for your learning this year. So we've been, tomorrow will be one month, and I know I've been out of commission for a week. Last week I was battling the flu, and I, forewarning you, I'll probably cough a couple times in this presentation, and I may not get quick enough to the mute button, so I'm not even going to bother doing it. So you'll hear me probably clear my throat multiple times, and I apologize, I'm human. But uh, that's where I've been for the last few days, battling that. Uh, but the first of three baseline measurements for you as the student this year is to observe the ability for you to capture, regain, mitigate, if you will, a drawdown. I'm going to encourage you to go into, uh, before I say this, okay, <laughs> let me type this out because invariably you're going to have somebody come out here and take a sound bite from this and take it completely out of context. So, Okay, so what this is, is a way for you to determine your growth. So there's no better way to determine how much you have learned than by being put in a laboratory experiment and basically giving you, actually I just realized I spelled that wrong. <laughs> oh man. The the measurement of understanding how to recapture or mitigate drawdown. Uh, obviously, as a as a trader, whether you're speculating in a demo, paper trading, or a live account, funded account, whatever, uh, you're going to do it wrong. Okay, invariably you're going to get it wrong. You do something incorrectly, and at 9:30 we will be looking at uh, live price action. But I just want to kind of like build the the foundation for what we're going to end up doing today as a, a laboratory experiment. There's never really been, in my observation, anyone teaching with an approach to inspiring one to go into drawdown with the purpose of correcting it. Uh, everyone teaches with their courses, their books, their, their mediums, if you, if you will. They'll teach how to chase money, how to go after and enter trades and you know, build up money, equity. Everyone's interested in trying to make money. And that's great. I mean, that's, a, that's why we're here, right? You know, we try to do this to learn a skill set that could hopefully be translated into 
speculating and profiting with life funds. Uh, I don't ever encourage any of you to do it with life funds, obviously, because I'm not a licensed financial advisor. So everything I do and everything I teach is by means of paper trading or demo trading. Uh, I'm not a financial advisor, so I can't give that type of advice. But we can talk openly, and I can give you my opinion about these candlesticks and what I think is likely to paint next for them. And that is not the same as trading with live funds, because that incurs what? Taxation and monetary loss. So if you make money, you have to pay taxes on it. And if you lose, you, know, you suffer monetary loss. So it removes, while you're training and learning and studying on your own, it removes all of that problem. That problem of measuring your ability, the aptitude of you as a student. And unfortunately, many of you try to reach for measuring your skill set way too early, way, way, way too early. And to encourage you at the beginning, which is the first baseline here, uh, you may fail this laboratory experiment this week. In fact, it's probably almost certain you're going to fail it. Uh, we have non-farm payroll conditions. We have two sessions tomorrow and on Wednesday where uh, the chairman, Fed chairman, will be testifying. So I purposely chose this week, which would be exactly how you, if you're out there rushing to get into trading with real money before you should, before you know how to trade, you would be trading in a week like this thinking you got to pass your funded account challenge because you only got a couple days left or whatever. <laughs> um, those things are going to push you in the real world to make decisions, which is also the reason why you don't want to be trading with real money before you have a nice nest egg. That means two years of living ex uh, expenses in the bank. That way you can draw from that if need be, not requiring yourself to trade right on the next trade week profit, month of profit. It puts too much pressure on you, especially if you're not seasoned as a, as a technician or a trader that's been doing it for a long time. When you place so much emphasis on the ability of you as the new trader to now feed yourself to make all of your ends meet, uh, that is unfortunately one of the biggest traps in this industry because if it's not get rich quick, it's trade for a living before you're ready. And I've never really pushed that message. I've never done those types of things, and I, which makes me somewhat boring in that respect. But there's a right way to do this, and there's a whole lot of other ways that's wrong. So... To help you understand where you are in your learning right now, uh, you have a limited experience and that's reasonable because we just, you know, we just started. So we're going to encourage you to use a paper trading account, which I've already talked about this on Twitter. I did a poll well, weeks back, maybe a, week, a month or so ago, and I asked everyone if they were going to be using a funded account company or if they were going to go that route with their trading because they may not have speculation capital readily available where you can just go out and take you know, 25,000, 50,000 or 100,000 uh, dollars to go out and start trading. And the idea of everyone wanting to trade with funded accounts, obviously most people can't afford right away the upper tier, like the 150,000. And majority of, if I'm not mistaken, I can't recall exactly, but if I'm not mistaken, I think most of the poll results and I, I can I can be stand I can stand to be corrected rather, uh, but I think it was most of everyone wanting to go with the low end funded account tiers because they it's cheaper. Okay, that's how they're looking at it. But we're going to use the argument that even if that's what you did and you were successful with it, you would eventually want to do what graduate to the highest one and then probably do multiple accounts where you're copying yourself or whatever and. From my limited experience looking at them, I've never traded with a funded account. I've never done that. I have no interest in doing that personally. My son's about to embark on that, but it looks like the 150,000 for one of the most widely followed funded accounts or companies is about $150,000. And they give you a, a threshold of how much money you can take as a max loss day. And we're gonna basically inspire you to do that to yourself this week or specifically this day, particularly this day. Uh, before you close your charts today, the, the laboratory experiment is for you to have already created, if you haven't already done so, on TradingView. It's free to do this, folks. You go into the TradingView 
uh, paper trading thing. Click on reset, and you want to do 150,000. It's already set this to 150,000. And what you're going to do is you're going to sit at your computer today. It won't take long to do this, but you're going to. The market's open up right now. Give me one second. Let me switch over to. I'll come back to this discussion in a moment. I just want to watch the first few minutes of the. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so this is the new week opening gap for this week here. And I will give you a teaching. I mentioned I meant to do it last Wednesday, but I'm sick. But I will have one. I'll work on it tonight and tomorrow, and it'll be posted on my YouTube channel. So that way you'll know an introduction to my new week opening gap principle and what I use it for, how it helps me, how it can help you. But right now, you can see how we had created a short-term high here. Price is drawn back down below that new week opening gap. Didn't take out the sell side below here, but we have taken out buy side here. So I'm watching the dollar index, which I will I will be able to toggle through the charts here and feel confident that I won't lose the audio because I'm only using one scene with OBS. So OBS is the, the screen capturing software that I'm using so you can see what I'm looking at real time. And I saw a joker out there saying I don't use live data. This is live data, folks. Okay, I mean, this is as live as you're going to get. There's a small little delay between me talking, but it's literally seconds. So let's go into a five minute chart with ES. I'm going to call on this label here throughout the session this morning. <clears throat> All right, so you're you're never really trying to rush, especially today, because we've had a nice big range expansion on the upside on the daily chart Friday. We have Fed Chairman tomorrow and on Wednesday speaking. So there isn't likely to be a lot of animation in the market today. It doesn't mean that you can't participate. It doesn't mean you can't study and, and observe what price is doing. But you got to keep your expectations within reason. So let's take a look at why this might go back down into the new week opening gap here. Because we've taken buy side here and look at the dollar index here. So we've taken a sell side liquidity pull here. So we have a little fair value gap there. So I'm watching if we get up there, does it respect that or does it go through it? I'm not interested in doing anything the first few minutes of a day like today. Just because the market opened, just because the opening bell has rang, doesn't mean we rush out there and just try to you know, plunk down a bet that's gambling. So I'm going to pull up. And periodically, I'll, I'll toggle through these charts. On the right-hand side, that's the U.S. cash. It's a CFD. Well, you can't trade those in the United States. And then on the left hand side is the March contract for ES. So I'm looking at the relationship between the lows here on dollar. Watching to see if we can get that high high on ES. So the first few minutes of 930's opening, what I'm doing as an analyst, I'm watching price and justify whether or not the initial first few minutes of trading is tipping its hand to show me what it wants to reach for. Uh, gun to my head, I believe that, you know, ultimately because we've gone as hard as far as we have on the upside here, I believe we're going to go to the next new opening gap. Which takes us back to this chart here, and that would be up here. So the minimum upside objective studying price right now would be 4077. But I'm watching throughout the first few minutes of the day to see if that is in fact what it wants to do. If it wants to do so, then down close candles will be supported by price or su will support price rather. And it will want to expand continuously up and not try to go lower. And that's institutional order flow. 
Yeah, I don't need any kind of like ladders or depth of market thing on the right hand side of my chart to do that. And you don't need trend lines, you don't need level two data for that. It's just simply reading the, the price in price action itself. We drop down into a five minute chart using this time frame. Okay. So if you look at this little fair value gap right here, I'm going to try something. Somebody suggested something to me. I'm not sure if it's even working. I'm trying to find a way to highlight the uh, the cursor when I'm using OBS. I know somebody sent me a, a file that I can download or whatever. I'm going to try not to add too many things to my computer. I don't trust this stuff. Let's try it one more time. It's, it's not it's not doing what I was I was told if I hit click if I click the control button twice it would do something with the first and highlight it but I haven't seen anything. So this fair value gap here we've traded down into it and this down close candle as I mentioned we want to see its support price and look to see if it can expand. If it does if it goes above here we want to see it run into that forty seventy seven level. As long as we're above the new week opening gap this morning. We side with being bullish and we would want to see dollar index fail to go higher in other words trade lower and i, I was asked multiple times how do i add those charts on the bottom you click this little button up here and the compare symbol drop down menu comes up and i go to dixie and i click on new pane and i go over here I change it to candlestick. You can use a line basis, but if you want to use it comparing the actual price action to one another. And setting it to all black. And that's my color scheme. We get a lot of people asking that too. So now you see it. Okay, so So we want to see dollar index take out its sell side here and allow for ES to expand to the upside. And we would want to see, this is all just tapering, folks. I'm not telling you to buy it. You shouldn't be doing anything with your uh, paper trading account yet. <clears throat> Looking at NASDAQ, NASDAQ's a little bit of a wild one this morning. So we have this a small little run above this short term high here on ES. And NASDAQ's really looking weak here. Let me pull that up for you. So we have sell side here between below this low, extend it through here. Watch and see how it reacts below that. And again, this is in your notes on a day like this, and this is because of the calendar being what it is. We have Fed Chairman, you know, the next two days testifying during a non-farm payroll week. So that is going to be a very, very difficult week to navigate. And there's no shame in saying that. Now, I'm sure there's going to be people out there that run services, sell things, and they're going to say after the week ends, it was an easy week. <laughs> I'm telling you, and honestly, it's going to be a hard week because everything that's stacked against us as traders is indicating such. So on a one minute chart, notice that we have not seen that lower low with this low here with ES. Let's go back to NASDAQ again real quick. See how we've gone below here? So this relationship between NASDAQ finding its way lower where ES hasn't done so. Right there. Relatively speaking, 
the leader, should everything uh, move to the upside, is being indicated with ES being relatively stronger in the dollar index. So still looking like it wants to take out its sell sign. I got questioned also, will I be trading in front of you this year? Yes, you will see me trading. I'm predominantly trying to teach you first, but yes, you'll see me entering trades. Yes, you'll see me pyramiding trades. Yes, you'll see me hitting targets. And yes, I have something special to share with you in December. <laughs> you asked for it, so you're going to get it. So of all these candles here, they're consecutively all down close, which is equivalent to a five minute down close candle. And I'll talk about that in a second. But notice how we went from the opening of this candle, draw that out in time here, which is also into another discount array, which is what a volume balance. A volume balance is where we have a separation of any candle or candles, because it can be more than just two where there's no overlapping of the bodies. The bodies have to overlap or at least meet. If they don't meet or overlap, then that means that there is a volume imbalance there. And it's more likely to see price create another return to that level. There. Preferably, you want to see a body laid across that. That's how I like to see it. But in a fast market, you don't need to do that. So, so far, dollar index is still finding difficulty getting down below its intraday low. And we've still not done much in terms of price delivery. So how would I coach you on utilizing a day like today? That way we know what we're looking for and expect it, not just talk about it after the fact. Um, you want to wait the first 30 minutes and then trade inside that 10 o'clock hour. Okay, and then study what that first macro will do between 9.50 and 10.10. Now a macro, again, is algorithmic. It will cause the market to run for liquidity or run for an inefficiency. Usually by then, if the market hasn't done much, that usually will give us the, the tipping of the hand what it will likely do going into the lunch hour, between lunch hour being 11 o'clock to noon. <clears throat> if you look at this low here, this high halfway between this low this high one standard deviation is here negative one I want to see does it have the willingness to try to get to this level here I want to see it ultimately try to gravitate towards this level here but we have to measure how much distance I'm not sorry how much speed at which we see in price getting to this level here how we trade to this level, if at all, indicates how we will trade once we get into a new week opening gap that's resting above price here. One of the hardest things you're going to contend with as a trader is the impulse to want to do something. You want to do something, okay? And doing something when you don't know what you're looking to engage with, what is it you're trying to speculate on? What's the... What's the premise of why you're even trying to trade today or any day for that matter. And it needs to be clear. It needs to be rooted on strong foundations, why price should even do anything. Look, looking at this, there's really nothing except for the fact that we've had initial first few minutes trading down into a fair value gap that was on a five minute chart. I'll go back up to that five minute chart now, which was this one here we outlined. We traded down to it here. But look at how we're behaving at the highs. Is this a market that's shown a willingness to want to expand aggressively after it's taken the short-term high out where there would be what? Buy stops. So buy stops resting above the short-term high here have been engaged, engaged multiple times here, not just once, two times. And has it shown any willingness to want to break off and start running higher? Not as of yet. Has it shown a willingness to break and reject that high? It's like a turtle suit false breakout and want to collapse below this very value gap, not as of yet. So this is where it's very difficult for me as, a, as an educator to make you understand 
how that impulse for you to want to do something. And then the first run in the morning, when you see that, if we're not part of it, if I haven't said clearly, this is what we would be wanting to do. It feels like you've been cheated from a move and that's fear of missing out. And that's, that, that goes away this year because you're going to see how to be, well, in better control of yourself and your impulses as a, as a speculator in trading. Now look what I'm watching here. I'm seeing how price is making another attempt to make a higher high, but I'm observing down here on the dollar index. Is that same thing occurring with lower prices on the dollar? Because they both should be dancing together. It should be like this perfect symmetry between both of them. If the ES is spreading its wings higher, the dollar index should be indicating what? Risk on by posting lower prices in dollar index. Are you seeing that yet in dollar down here? No, it's a stagnant. Meaning what? We're in a very lethargic opening range. Opening range is the first 30 minutes of trading from 9.30 and 10 o'clock. It's always going to be the same way. It's never going to be morphing into something else. The opening range is that. Okay, and where we open in that opening range is what we're going to talk about now. Right now we're showing electronic trading hours. That's shown by this little tab down here, ETH. If you click on that, you can see it says electronic trading hours. During the first few minutes at, at the opening bell at 9.30, you want to have a reference of where we were last time we closed. Let me take this down. So this is what we had here on Friday. That's where we closed the, the day session, regular trading session hours. And then we had what? We opened up here, rallied up. We've already shown what? We've ran that buy side, but we have not seen what confirming it. Dollar index doing what? Dollar index has not made the lower low as we would expect it to do it here. Indicating what? It's likely to want to pull back down into this opening range gap. Now the opening range gap is always at the 930 opening bell. And that's the difference between where we open here, the very first opening price, to where we closed. So that opening range would be defined by this. You can do this with you know rectangles, you can do it with lines. It's it's a matter of personal choice choice. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> My voice is letting me know. Not too much boy. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's just the, this is the opening range gap okay that is not new day uh new day opening gap new day opening gap is the difference between the closing price at 5 p.m and the opening price at 6 p.m new week opening gap is the difference between last friday's closing price and sunday's first opening price that's the new week opening gap. okay so there's three specific gaps that i teach and you'll learn more but those are the differences and where they are and what they are. But this is the opening range gap. And it occurs at the 930 opening bell every day. Not, not that there's always a gap, but when there's a separation you know, between where we stopped trading the regular session before that trading day and where we open this one, that's the opening range gap. So let's go back into electronic trading hours and add that range here back into our chart so that way we'll be able to refer to it in electronic hours on the chart. Let's change it to uh, that. It's probably not pretty for you, but it's working for me. All right, so now we have the opening range gap showing on our electronic trading hours chart. Again, that's down here. All of this is free in addition you know well, I mean, obviously you have to have real-time data which is what i'm showing you here but you can toggle through your charts even on a delay basis and be able to see what i'm showing you here but there's nothing nothing indicating like a, a trade there's no trade that would have been formed by now there's no entry here nothing and one of the things that you'll see many times being asked of me in comments and tweets that come to me directly to me and by way of messages on trading view that you can't see obviously but they're usually you know, these things over here or up here rather <clears throat> the um the question is, is you know how, how do i how do i trust and how do i fear or not fear missing a move 
because I know what I'm looking for, which is kind of like the whole point of this year with you and I together, real time or real time data, is this, there's no, there's no impending doom. There's no emergency. There's no rush to get in and do something right now, because if I don't do it right now, I'm going to miss the big move. There's always moves. And that comes in trusting that the things that you're learning, they repeat. And even if there is a move that takes place, that's really nice and clean, which we haven't seen any indication of yet. It doesn't matter that if you didn't participate in that or not. It matters not that you've missed it because that trade is one of many of them that will, will be forming in the entirety of your career as a speculator or as a student of the market. You're going to see lots of movements in the price action that you weren't participant to. There isn't a trader out there that is in every move. You can't be. You have to sleep. You have to eat. You have to spend time with your family. You, know, you get ill like I was last week. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do much at all. <clears throat> so you, you have to give yourself permission. I'm watching this wick here. Consequent encroachment that wick. I'm watching. Does it respect that and press down into the sell side here? Or is it want to make another attempt to go higher? Dollar index looks a little softer in here. So in my mind, if the dollar was going to go lower, it would need to do it in here now. Down here is the dollar index. Okay, so we have dollar index approaching its sell side liquidity pool. And again, this is, I don't usually do this. I, I do it while I'm educating and doing examples and you can see me doing it while I'm recording trade executions and such. I'm trying to tell myself and remind myself to annotate things on the chart as I'm talking to help you see what it is. But this is where the sell side is that I'm referring to when I say dollars look like it wants to reach down to a sell side it's this low down here and sell side is sell stops resting below an old low or relative equal low So as of right now, we've been trading for 22 minutes <clears throat> and not much has happened yet, which is again, one of the things that you learn by tape reading for months, not just one, one week and think, okay, now I'm going to go in there and demonstrate because I, I got to be doing something or I got to trade with a small live account or I won't be really learning how to trade. And the only thing I'll be learning by doing that is how to be a fear, be fearful of, of losing and be emotionally attached to the outcome. That's what, that's what trading with a live account, even with a small amount does before you know how to trade before you, before you know how to read the marketplace. That's what that does. And anybody tells you anything different, they're giving you bad advice, period. End of story. That's exactly how it's a perfect recipe to make you afraid of trading, to make you afraid of the next setup. Even when you take a losing trade, because you have not properly conditioned yourself or desensitized yourself to the outcome of the trade. Whereas if by trading with live money, when you don't have to trade consistently, you prepare your mind to be fearful of the outcome, which is the number one task as a trader is to overcome that fear. You got to remove it. And this is what you do it. And it's just how you do it. You, you study price action to the point where it's boring to you seeing the setups. And you also condition yourself knowing what it's like in the times where it's not likely to run off and do a big move that you would feel regretful that you weren't a participant on. So what I'm watching is I want to see how we react should price trade below this low here for the sell side on dollar and how we take this high or if they keep that high in place.
from a market symmetry stance, if we take this low over here out in the dollar, then everything is balanced. It's a symmetrical market. So the market would have to really make a move of any of, of serious uh, momentum to kind of like get things moving this morning. Otherwise, it's probably going to trade less listening. Now let's hypothetically refer to our economic calendar, and you're welcome to look at that you know, at, at your leisure. You can do it now if you want. Tomorrow morning and on Wednesday morning, the Fed Chairman Powell is testifying. At least that's what my calendar says. So uh, because of that, there's a lot of folks that have their hands in their pockets right now, and they're just going to wait. They're going to wait and see how the chips fall over the next two days. Now, gamblers, okay, high energy caffeine junkies, they're out there always trying to do something in the marketplace. They're chopping at the bit. They're going to tell you, yes, this is when you want to trade. Uh, that's when you want to gamble because you don't know the influence of what the market's going to do. And these same people that will tell you that, it's usually they usually have a really bad performance on those days. And they make it public so you can see it. So it's not a matter of me making a conjecture here. It's pretty well documented. And those individuals that are interested in learning how to control themselves be measured in their reach into risk. They don't rush in these environments. They sit back and they wait because it's the first mouse that gets clipped by the mousetrap. It's the second mouse that comes up and gets the cheese. You don't want to be the first mouse to just... Let the market tip its hand. It, it, we have plenty of time, plenty of time over the month, over this week, over the course of this year to see m m m amazing price runs. But you're seeing that there are certain price runs that I'm not personally interested in. And you can't appreciate that. If I just say, well, I'm looking for low resistance liquidity run signatures, well, what the hell does that even mean? That's what you're learning. You're learning what it's like to be in high resistance. It would be one thing to say, okay, I'm only going to sign on and do live streams in low resistance liquidity run conditions. Okay, you'll see me call the market. It'll run right off into my targets. It'll barely have any drawdown from where I'm calling. But you learn nothing from that because you will not know how to identify what does it feel like? What does it look like? What are the conditions that present high resistance liquidity runs? I see several people, and I'm sure it's because they don't watch everything or look at everything or listen to the Twitter spaces I've done in the past where I've gone through and mentioned what the characteristics are that leads to a high resistance liquidity run condition, which is, yes, the market's moving around. Yes, the market can go to targets, but those conditions I opt out of. I don't want to participate in those days. And you're going to learn to participate in those only to get an appreciation for what it's like when you're not in them and when you're not in a high resistance liquidity run condition, which means in simple terms where the market just quickly wants to run from one pool of liquidity to the next or one premium array to the discount array opposing it. And it just does it efficiently. It does it quickly. It doesn't mess around like what you're seeing here. This is all high resistance liquidity conditions. The market is in no hurry. Okay, in, in plain terms, you want to write in your journal. In high resistance liquidity run conditions, the market is in no hurry to get to an opposing discount or premium array. Period. Because liquidity or inefficiency is encapsulated by that idea. Whereas in an environment like a low resistance liquidity run, it's in a hurry very quickly to get to where it wants to go. And that's what I'm training you. And this is what I teach my students to look for in price action. And it helps filter out the environments that most likely will give you choppy days where most traders get beat up. You look at social media, look at live streamers, look at uh, Twitter, Discord rooms, you know, whatever. Invariably, on the days that I'm teaching you that it's going to be high resistance, we're, we're reserved. 
We're not in here trying to push, 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 push. We're being very selective in what it is that we're expecting in price action. But the predominance in social media will be shown by them reflecting on their poor performance. I got chopped up today. I got beat up today. What a crappy day. What a crappy market. What a crap. It, it's not that it's crappy. Okay, the market's not crappy. It's just you're in a condition that's high resistance. And unless you've been trained to observe it in such a way, you, you can't appreciate it. Now, I'll give you an example of what high resistance is in this, in this very moment here. We've had ES trade down to our five and a fair value gap here, which entered into what? what? What did it enter into? When it dropped here, what was it really doing? It was trading into sell side liquidity, sell stops below here. Who would have a sell stop there? Anyone that has been trying to go long and it starts to move here, they're going to put their stop right below there. Who does that? Retail does. If they're going to be using a stop loss, that's what you're going to do because they're afraid. They want to jam their stop loss to what? What's the books and educators say to you all the time? Put your stop loss at break even. I don't teach you that. Eventually it will get there, but it needs to go to first partial and it needs to expand through for that to occur. We're not in a rush to move the stop loss. We rely on partials to do the most heavy lifting. It's not important for you to move your stop loss too early because you're not going to know where to put your stop loss in the beginning, which is the reason why I teach this style. It it buffers and provides a cushion for you to allow experience to dictate when you, as the speculator, using your model, when are you going to move your stop loss? When are you going to start reducing the risk with your stop loss? When will you move it to break even? Because every trader is going to grow at their own pace, my teaching style with doing that is helpful because, number one, it takes the worry out of worrying about that stop loss. The stop loss is being paid to do a job. If, it, if price hits it, it's been paid to do what? Remove you from more risk. So you've already paid it good money. If it needs to do its job, it's paid. So don't worry about getting stopped out. If you're getting stopped out, you did something wrong as a trader. It doesn't mean your methods failed. It doesn't mean that you're flawed logic. It doesn't mean that you are you know, a terrible trader or that it's going to you know, fail in perpetuity going forward. It just means that that transaction, you made a human error, misguided judgment, and you failed on it. One transaction. It's a flat tire going to work. That's all it is. Cost of doing business, you're going to have it. But we're not looking for price simply just to run in our favor and move, remove risk entirely. What we're doing is we're studying when we're in a trade we're waiting to see price get to an opportunity for us to take something off. And there's so many people out there in this industry that have a pretty good size following. I mean, not a lot, but they have a pretty good following. And they constantly harp on the fact that taking partials is the stupidest thing in the world. And I've never understood that argument because you don't know if your model and your execution is going to yield a profitable exit if you're only accepting your final target at terminus and that's it. There's nothing else. It's all or nothing. And as an educator, it would be foolish of me or anyone else that's trying to teach something like this to say, hold for your full target or nothing at all. Number one, it's not encouraging when you get stopped out, when you don't know how to do what you're doing and you don't see anything, especially if you get something that could have allowed you to take something off. That's a partial. That's like you're, you're, you're a white belt. Okay. <laughs> when you open up a trade, you're a white belt. And then when it allows you to take something off, where's your, where's your green belt or your yellow belt? Then your second partial, and that's your blue belt or your brown belt. And then you get to your terminus, that's your black belt. Okay, you've arrived on that one trade. Your next trade, you got to start all the way back down to a white belt again. So you have to do, unfortunately, what the Western mind requires a lot, which is that belt system in martial arts, which really isn't a big thing in the Asian culture. They don't have that many belts. Okay, but Americans, we have to have a, a reward. Okay, kind of like a treat. You know, pat on the butt, you know, back. Like, yeah, you did good. You, you, you've been paying your monthly dues. <laughs> you showed up to class. So here you go. Here's another new belt color. But and when you're trading, you want to have 
a place that takes something off because a partial has never, a partial profit has never, ever, ever failed in making money. It's got a 100% strike rate. That's perfect trading, folks. Partials pay every single time. But you don't know, and the people that bloviate about how partials are not good, you don't know, and they don't know if their next trade or the one they're in right now, waiting for full target, is going to go there. You don't know that. So you're opening yourself up for full risk, whatever the initial risk was, only hoping to do what? Reduce the risk, but never take anything. So think about what goes on in trading. If traders that are in retail mindset theory, I'm watching to see if we expand to the upside here because dollar has broke here. So this should start to gravitate up into that new week opening gap. I'll come back to this. I haven't finished the, the point I'm trying to make. The, the idea of taking something off partially, you are paying yourself. You put yourself in the charts, you spent time, emotion, energy, mental equity, stressing. And when the market has presented an opportunity for you to take something off and get paid, are you going to work half the week and illness takes you out the rest of the week and tell your boss, listen, I couldn't finish the whole week. So just keep what you paid me or would have paid me for the few days I came in because I didn't do I didn't give you my full week. So I don't know. You don't owe me anything. <laughs> Who's going to do that? Right. But. If you listen to these people in this industry tell you that partials are stupid, don't ever do it. Their results are going to tell you that what they're saying is just denial. They're, they're not getting full targets. They're getting stopped out and losing a lot more than they would if you just take partials. I have illustrated this many times, even in my tape reading two weeks ago, you know, where I wanted to see the market go to because it's being very fickle right now. The markets are very difficult right now. It hasn't, hasn't nothing to do with there's no algorithm or they're, they're changing the algorithm. It just means that the market's very, very fickle. It's not wanting to move. It's being constrained. Because of that, if it was not for me saying, this is where you would take a partial, this is, this is a partial here. Note your chart, say this is, this is a screenshot, partial here. I'm conditioning you to do what you're trying to learn how to do, which is do what? Profit. See, you want, which is what the books are teaching and all these other yahoos on social media, they'll say, hold for your target or you don't have conviction about your model. No, my model says, get out with money. Get out where I can take money, where it offers it to me. If your model says, I'm always right or I get nothing and get stopped out, that's stupid to me. And it should be stupid to you as a, as a listener. Who wants to put all the time, open themselves up to the risk, and when they had an opportunity to pay, like right now, this would be a perfect opportunity if you had gone long on that fair value gap here or traded into this down close candle and it, this movement here. That's five handles. This would be a perfect opportunity, even though it hasn't hit the new week opening gap, this would be a perfect opportunity to do what? Take a partial. Because you don't know. If a bomb's going to drop somewhere or some craziness goes off in somewhere in, in the country or the world, it causes this to reverse and go harshly the other direction. You don't know that. I don't know that. So when I educate and I teach, I teach my students not to be worrisome or worried about that stop loss. It's there to do its job. Your focus is watching. Does it go to a level that allows you to do what? Get paid. And if you can get paid, that's the that's the that's what makes your bottom line go up. Not being perfect, not that your trade goes to target and no partials taken. That is such a hard task for a new student or a new trader to, to arrive at. So it makes no difference whether or not, you know, the way I teach and the way I teach you as a as a trader, it, it matters not if your targets are reached ultimately, because you're trying to do what? Add more to your bottom line. And when the market presents these opportunities to do that, unless you take a partial, the market's not going to do it for you. And there's been many times, and you've seen it you know, a few weeks back, where I openly gave you my limit order where I thought I was going to see an exit and the spread between the bid and ask on S&P did not let my limit order 
tag, the actual high of the candle was where my limit one was. And it pulled back against me and, and knocked me on my final balance of one contract. You don't know. You don't know if your target's going to hit. But when the market's presenting a billboard sign flashing saying, here, here's some money. Here's some money right here. All you got to do is scale out something that you are in a position of. But see, you don't want to do that because greed. And I'm teaching you how to manage greed by taking something off at logical positions and places in the price. And by doing that over time, you condition yourself and remove the whole necessity in your mind right now. You think, I have to be right. I have to be right. If I'm right, then I'm a good trader. No. No. You're a good trader if you manage risk and you stick to rules and you place profits on that bottom line when it's made available to you. Targets are just the best case scenario. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that states that mine, yours, or anybody else's in terms of targets are ever going to be reached. We don't know that. We're submitting to the idea, the likelihood. But nothing's for certain, especially today in these markets. These markets are extremely difficult. So when we drop below these relative equal lows here, that's sell stops being hit. Also trading into what? The fair value gap. It's on a five minute chart. But what, what, what else was it dropping into? Opening range gap. Remember I was showing you the difference between where we traded and closed on Friday? Here. That's Friday's close. And this is where we opened up this morning at 9.30. That opening range gap. Okay. We opened here and traded down. Traded down into it. It can have a complete closure of the gap. It can do a half of closure. Or it can do one quarter of the gap. What did it do here this morning? One quarter. It could have went to the half, didn't do it. And it showed what? Started stacking up price and showing a willingness to do what? Go back to my China trading. I said because we want to see it trade up into this area here. We want to see down close candles support price. Remember I said it incorrectly. I said we want to see price support down close candles. I said no, more specifically, we want to see down close candles supporting price. We've seen the fair value gap here. A short-term high here is taken. It trades back down into a down close candle, which is what? Potentially a bullish order block. Does this support price? The main threshold, which is the midpoint of that down close candle, is price being supported in that level there. I don't need to draw anything. You visually see it. Yes, it does. At the same time, we were looking for what in the dollar index? In the dollar index, we were looking for that sell side liquidity pool here. And we wanted to see price. We wanted to see price move lower through this low. If it does this, that means it's going to cause what? Risk on. Risk on is going to allow for ES to trade up. Trade up into what? The next new week opening gap. The next new week opening gap is up here. So 4077. We don't need 4077 to be traded to. Why? Why? Because we had already outlined a level before reaching that with our Fibonacci that would indicate that this is a, a fair place to expect a partial to be taken and not have to see that level be taken out or traded to. This is the magnet on price action. This this range up here between 4077 and 4084 even. But because we're below it, the first threshold is what? The low of the previous new week opening gap. Or not previous, but the next one in terms of relationship to where we are in price action. And the next one's here. So give me a second here. I just want to go through, I'm looking at my other charts. I've been talking about this one here and I haven't had much time to reflect on the other ones.
<clears throat> Are you the hands? Thank you. Can you see my feet? I know you probably, some of you probably think I'm running a ventriloquist act. Like I'm just, <laughs> there's nobody standing next to him. His, his son's not there. Not that it's a big deal, but I know there's people out there that don't believe my son's actually standing here. Can you say hello, Cameron? Hello? 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 Say hello. hello. Talk when I'm talking. It's not me. Really, no, it's not me. Hello. <laughs> there you go. He's got a deeper voice than I do. He looks like a linebacker. So, now, because of where we're trading at right now, from that fair value gap here, and, and, and as I mentioned, we want to see the down close candles support price. We see that here. I'm going to annotate the five minute bullish order block. And I'm going to drop down into a one minute chart. Now, some of you that are new, or some of you that are very young or impatient, just want to be doing something. There are other YouTubers out there that are literally pushing a button in front of you and go and watch them. I watch some of them. I like them. Okay. But if you're trying to learn how to read price action, the way I do it and the way I teach my students, the way they're making big money with it, this is how you do it. There is no other way. There is no video that I can produce. There is no book that I'm going to be able to write, a chapter or chapters. I could do 20 books. Unless you are seeing it happen real time and explaining what it looks like, you won't understand it. And static charts or hindsight, even market replay, isn't the, isn't the same because you, you have the benefit of knowing when you have market replay. That's why market replay you know, reports when people do back testing and they show all their equity curve and stuff. You know, that's all form fitted. You, you have that benefit of knowing. Whereas this, you watching this have no idea where these candles are painting. But I'm drawing your attention to specific things why it should do certain things and what I'm measuring it against. I'm, I don't show any indicators here, but I'm looking at the relationship between the dollar index and that of the ES. And I'm also looking at the other charts that are across you know, eight monitors in, in front of me. And I'm rela relating the information that they're presenting to me in relationship to this as well. But look at the difference between a price run like this. Yes, we had a run to the fair value gap that we went down inside of the opening range. Yes, we had a displacement above a short-term high. Yes, we were watching the buy side. Does it want to expand? Does it want to go through that? It was stalling here. And then we had to take our attention to what? The dollar index. We were watching and monitoring the dollar index. Everything became focal to dollar. Does dollar want to go down below its old low, which would then, again, this here, this low here. We've gone through that. What were we looking for? A willingness to go through it and not have any interest in going back above it. We want to see it drive down into it. If it does that, then we can trust that this new week opening gap will still be a draw on liquidity. But do we just simply buy it and hold for it to trade to it? You can if you want to be like everybody else. And you're trading with stress when you're not really versed yet as a speculator versus the order block. Down close candles are supposed to do what? Support price. It does so. Every down closed candle doesn't make it an order block. But if it trades down into it, we want to see it do what? Trade not below the mean threshold, which is the middle of the range of this candlestick. It trades down to it here, here, and then we start to rally. We come back down, touch it again. I mentioned while we were trading just like this in this candle, I said, okay, it should expand higher, gravitating towards this new week opening gap. Why? Because I took your attention down into the dollar index. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've already hit the 4077 level. Look at the high right here. Look up here in the upper left hand corner. This candle's high is exactly that low, 4077. Now it's 4077 and a half. So we want to watch and observe does it gravitate to the consequent encroachment, which is the midpoint between the low of the new week opening gap and the high of the new week opening gap? This alone right here, done. 80% of your trade should be off. So a partial should have been taken in here and an 80% off here. Then at that time, at that time, your stock could roll to break even or something better than break even. And it's up to you as to what that would be. 
in, in my opinion, your stop should be just about below midpoint of this range of price action. Equilibrium would be right about here, so your stop loss will be here for the remaining 20%. Now, everything I just outlined probably bored a lot of you that were impatient and just want to see something spectacular. But I would have cut my own arm off in 1990s to have someone outline what I just outlined to you. Looking for what it is I'm specifically aiming for in price. What do I trust to know that price is going to continuously drive to that level? What factors am I weighing out? What am I looking for? What do I not want to see in price action? And everything that would support the idea is inside price action. It's not an indicator. So now let's take a quick look at these lows here. We're going to look at that in the NASDAQ. So the low formed at uh, 930. Okay, we ended up making a lower low here. Let's look at the YM. This is, this is the Dow. I don't trade the Dow, but I use it for um, s &T. So here's 930. So what do we see there? See that low? This low right here. I'm waiting to see if my live stream is showing my cursor. Okay, I can see it now. So this low here in relationship to that low. We have a higher low on Dow, and ES, we have a lower low, comparably. See that? As it trades into the fair value gap. So this fair value gap, you know, we talked about that real time, and we wanted to see it indicate to us, even though we've taken out buy side here, at that time, when we're in a, a slow market, a slow market is a market that is predisposed to have adversities because of the economic calendar. In plain terms, Fed Chairman Powell is going to talk tomorrow, Tuesday morning and on Wednesday. Because of that, there's a, a lot of traders and, and money that's not being put to risk yet. That means they're not trying to speculate right now. Because of that, the market's going to have generally the tendency to create small ranges, small fluctuations in price action, and you want to be very nimble and not try to marry the idea of a market just blasting off and having 120 handles up or 120 handles down. The likelihood of a big move today is not likely. Whereas tomorrow, because of his, testif his testifying, that invites the opportunity for market makers to exaggerate price delivery. So we expect big movement tomorrow in the 10 o'clock hour. A lot of volatility in the 10 o'clock hour on Wednesday and on Tuesday. The afternoon today, uh, since this morning is pretty much, in my opinion, done, um, I would look for, again, a very similar small type of range movement. And I will tip my hand as to what I think might happen on Twitter. Uh, I won't be doing a live session in the last hour. But uh, I want you to do this homework assignment. And again, this is going to seem completely absurd, but I promise you it helps. It helps to understand where you are in your understanding and learning. But I want you to paper trade the ES and trade with, I don't care how big of a size you make. The purpose is, is you want to draw that account from 150000 of paper trading account you want to drop it down $3,000 today. Try not to go more than $3,000. Get as close as you can to $3,000. Is that way your account should reflect around $147,000. Once you have that, your, your assignment is before Friday's close, you have to get back to $150,000. But you cannot, you cannot drop down to 40, oh, sorry, 144,000. You can't go there. Okay. 
you can lose more, but you just can't drop down to 144,000. If you hit 140,000 at any time, you failed. Do not be afraid to fail. The whole purpose of this is as a baseline. It's a baseline measurement because this is the beginning of the year. We've only been for a few weeks doing this. And in the midpoint of the summer, before we get to November, which is when we end in the mentorship that we're doing here every day, I will do it again. And you're going to see the ability that you have in November that you don't have right now. And you might have a measured improvement the second time we do it halfway through. I don't know when exactly that's going to be, but I'm going to give you the assignment to do the same thing. Do not be afraid. Don't be, in other words, if, if you hurt yourself doing it in the paper trading and you go down below 144,000, log it that you failed and have no shame in it. And then you're going to compare what you do the second time you do it in a couple months. And you're probably going to notice something totally different, which is what you would expect, right? And if you learned and know more, you'll be able to do it better. But I'm purposely choosing this week because it's hard. Exactly how the real world trading is going to be. You're going to feel like you want to chase big movement. You're going to see other people talk about, oh, there's going to be movement because the Fed chairman's talking. They all want to be part of these big volatile days. But those big volatile days bring what? Max loss days. So how do I answer your question of how do I come back from drawdown? How do I overcome fear of losing? You know, how do I navigate when I'm down? What do I do to fix it? Well, I'm teaching you, but you have to ruin yourself here in your paper trading account. That way you have it, you see it, and then you have an experience of trying to fix it based on what you know right now versus what you'll see, you know, halfway through this year. When we do the second baseline measurement of your understanding, you might feel the second one too. And there's no shame in that. But I promise the majority of you won't fail that third one. You're going to know exactly what you're looking for. You're going to know exactly how to do it, how to engage it. And you will have conquered the whole fear of drawdown. You won't worry about trying to get it back real quick. Notice I didn't say create a pseudo $3,000 drawdown and then try to get it back today. I didn't say that. I said this week. That's the proper mindset of correcting drawdown. Not, I hurt myself. I need to fix it right now. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed and hope nobody asked me what my results were today because I couldn't be honest and tell them because I'd be embarrassed that someone would say, you're, you're, you're a scrub. You can't trade or whatever because you did something human. You made a mistake. You did something. You lost some money. Every, every trader loses money. Every trader loses money. Every trader does it wrong. These are my concepts, and sometimes I try to finesse it. I try to bring my own ego into it sometimes and think I'm going to outperform my own stuff. And then it hands me my ass. Okay, that's normal. It's going to happen to you too. There is no perfect trader out there. There's no perfect system. There's no perfect anything. Anything you know that is good, placed in the hands of a human being, and I'm human. Obviously, I've been, I was sick. Okay. The, I'm not an AI, I'm a real person. But placed in the hands of a human being, the frailty of our humanity will produce substandard results. And you have to, right now, come to grips with it and you know, treat your trading education with a new resolve and permitting you as the student, as the trader in development, to be fallible to make mistakes. You're going to blow it. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to do dumb things. You're going to look at the market and expect it's going to go higher. And it won't. It goes lower. And you didn't and then you didn't participate in that. One. So how do you avoid regretting that or chasing it, knowing that the next moves will come? See, that's what is missing from most of every trader out there that's on social media chasing people like me, following me. You're waiting for me to drop a breadcrumb. You're watching other live streamers do amazing, pushing the button, you know, taking the, uh, kicking the risk on in front of everyone and, and, and making money. I have a great deal of respect for that. But I'm not trying to do that with you. I want you to be an independent thinker. And there's nothing wrong with still watching because I'm an independent thinker and I watch other live streamers that do well. I watch other live streamers crash and burn. I don't sit in their comment section or their chat room and troll them. I'm just observing 
their reaction to their own decisions. And I'm trying to see how they perform as the trader. I don't care or even subscribe to any of the, the methodology they use, even if it is profitable. I don't, I don't have any affinity for any of that. But I take all those experiences by watching traders and watching the reactions of other folks that are in those chat rooms. And it allows me to, number one, build lessons for all of you because I'm basing it on something that I already anticipate by watching traders that don't have a lot of experience. They want something to occur in price. They want to manifest their expectation and they want to impose their will. And that is unfortunately not how this is won. The business is won by having an understanding about what is likely to occur and then looking for evidence to support that idea and submitting to it, even if it's uncomfortable. And you have to submit to the amount of time. And time being 10.30 now, it hit our new week opening gap. It traded down into our opening range gap, which is shaded in that. I don't know what that color would be. With the, I don't know that. What would you call that color? Like a tangerine color, like an orange, like a tan. Orange. I don't know. I, I don't know. Let's call it orange tan, whatever. That the opening range, it drops down into that and into a fair value gap and clearing relative equal lows here at the same time that the Dow was not willing to make what? That lower low comparably. So this is an SMT divergence. So it reflects what? Accumulation of longs. But you can't just simply take it on its own. You have to start weighing out the risk on risk off, which is like the rocket fuel behind your trades. If you're going long on ES or going long on NASDAQ, you want to see that dollar index going lower. You do not want to see the dollar index rallying. You can see it consolidate. It can consolidate and the markets can still see the index futures you know, move, but they're going to be what? Quickly corrected at a later time when that dollar starts moving. Dollar is a, a wonderful instrument to measure if your trade's going to be extremely efficiently, quickly delivered in terms of your target. If it is not in support of, which would be the opposite direction, this entire run here from that fair value gap up to here, if we look at the dollar index, it should be lower. It has been. But now look what we're seeing with the dollar index. See how we're coming off the lows here? Coming off the lows here, it's trading up in this city, sell sign balance, buy sign efficiency. Retail sees this as what? Support broken here. Now it should act as resistance, right? I don't subscribe to that. You know, I, I, I just think it's too myopic. The fact that we're in here, we might trade up to consequent encroachment, have a failed lower low here on the dollar index, and then consolidate a little bit going into lunch. That's how I would interpret it. That's how I'd expect it. Why? Because I don't think there's a lot of movement that would be reasonable or reasonable to expect today because of what we're expecting to see delivered with Fed Chair Powell tomorrow in the morning session. So if you haven't already noted your calendar or looked at it, uh, that's something you want to do on the weekends before the, the trading week even begins. Don't just look at what the calendar is going to be on Monday. Look at the entire weekly calendar. Where are the big heavy stones in terms of high impact or medium impact news drivers? Is the Fed Chair going to be talking? Because if you have those types of things, it's going to dictate how we have the weekly range delivered to us. It's going to dictate how the daily ranges are formed. Are they going to be one-sided? Are they going to be slow and high resistance like this is? See, this is not a low resistance liquidity run, even though it performed like we were outlining. And it's done so nicely. It just takes a whole lot of time to get there. And I'm not trying to teach you impatience. But the things that you're looking for through impatience right now, because you're limited in your understanding, the, the, the very thing that you're looking for is a real quick, sudden price move that gets you right to your target and you're out. That way you don't incur a lot of time holding risk. I understand that. That's exactly why I went into my analysis and studied these types of situations and conditions. Because I, as a young man, was impatient, extremely impatient.
So I wanted to be in trades that ran away in my favor, got to my targets quickly, and I got out of the trade so I didn't have to have any risk. And then I had to recuperate because it was very stressful for me. I'm running a thousand scenarios in my mind. What if it hits my stop? What if it doesn't go to my target? What happens if it just sits here and it doesn't move tomorrow? Because I was holding trades overnight as a commodity trader. So it was a very daunting task for me because it doesn't fit my personality. I make decisions really quick and you might not feel that way as a person or have that personality or that characteristic as a person. You might be a little bit more slower in terms of making your decisions. And this trade may be perfect for you. You might look at it and say, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Great. That's wonderful. I'm not trying to say that you can't find trades in high resistance liquidity run signatures. You can. I don't like them because I want to be in trades that tear off right from my entry and run right into my partials, run into my target, and I'm done. Wham, bam, thank you, man. That's, that's what I like. I like that quick, sudden, immediate feedback. It makes it exciting. It makes it fun. It's almost like, you know, a treasure hunt. I'm looking for that. I mean, we can see these types of moves every day. These types of moves are not hidden from you. I mean, obviously, you can see it. It's, it's been outlined this morning to you. But it's not the same as a low resistance. Low resistance means there's nothing causing resistance for speed. Whereas this, because of the economic calendar, and we have two Fed chairman uh, test, uh, testifying events on Tuesday and on Wednesday, and it's the first day of the week, there isn't a whole lot of excitement right now. So you have to do what? Allow the market to seek fair value. Fair value is, yes, shown with my fair value gap. Yes, that's fair value. But from a fund level, F-U-N-D, large fund level, Larger traders than us, the deeper pockets, billions of dollars. Okay, those traders are going to be induced. They're going to be introduced, introduced to a level in price that is intended to inspire new trade, new order flow to remove liquidity or replace liquidity, which is in the form of my new week opening gap. That's why I taught it when I first taught it a couple weeks ago in, in February was the first time I ever made it and taught it to anybody else. Um, this, this premise here, okay, you're, you're really supposed to have this range divided into four quadrants. And I, asked, uh, I saw a guy ask me, can we split this into octants? And no, you can do whatever you want to do. I, I, I split it into fours, first quarter, half, third quarter, and then high. So it's high, low, midpoint, and the midpoint between that. So it's four quadrants. It's not quarters theory. I saw a guy say, oh, he's teaching quarters theory. He's just renamed it. <laughs> Listen, you guys got to learn. Okay, study what I'm doing. Place that stuff you think it is right next to what it is I'm doing. And you'll see it's totally not the same thing. It's not. So when we have these low resistance liquidity runs, what does that mean? I know some of you are probably still having a hard time understanding what that looks like or what, what am I referring to. High resistance is from the fair value gap and the order block. It did, it, it did rally to where we were looking for. That's wonderful. Great. Log it. It is, it is what it is. Okay. A low resistance. And what do I mean? What's the resistance factor in that? What's, what's causing said resistance? Like what is the resistance I'm referring to? The resistance in speed. Whenever you watch my trades and I would annotate them and say, okay, I'm, I'm looking for speed and distance. That's indicating what? I'm looking for a low resistance price run. It's not that because I'm using the term resistance that I'm expecting it to trade to a resistance level and therefore go lower. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is in a high resistance liquidity run, the price will still gravitate to where I'm thinking it might go to. But it can go up, retrace a lot, consolidate, go up, retrace a lot, consolidate, and go up, retrace a lot, go sideways, go up. That is high resistance, not because it's being resisted because of specific levels. It's being resisted in the scope of price, speed delivery. The delivery speed, that's what I'm looking for. I wanna see speed. If the level of speed is in the trade, 
behind me in that in that speculation, then it's a low resistance. Resistance is low in terms of the speed. There's nothing limiting the movement from this order block here to here in terms of time. A low resistance liquidity run would have been from here in two or three candles it's there versus all of these. So that hopefully will help you understand the difference between, because you can trade profitably in high resistance liquidity runs. You can. There's, I just prefer not to. They're just, they're very boring to me. I don't like them. I like going in, like looking for trades like a word search, okay, or a crossword puzzle. I'm looking for the ones that's going to be very quick, sudden, have a lot of magnitude, and the speed just runs off. It's exciting. It makes your trading really fun. Whereas this, for a new student, you probably watched all this stuff. And some of you were probably hoping it was going to fail. <laughs> the idea of sitting here watching these candles paint, it feels like watching grass grow. But it's not like that when you're trading in low resistance liquidity runs. It's fast. It's excitement. There's a lot of price movement. It's just, you'll see. Um, trust, trust me. Right now, it's we're still in this really crummy kind of uh, market condition, but it'll loosen up. And when it does, you will absolutely know by definition, because you've seen it then, what a low resistance liquidity run feels like and see what it looks like in your chart. You'll watch it. You'll see how fast it takes off and speed. It's just like, boom, doesn't waste a lot of time. It just immediately wants to go somewhere. And if you're on board, that is so fun. It's so fun. These types of moves, yes, while profitable, while delivering to targets that we can see before they deliver them, that's we're not making an argument against that. And again, I'm not trying to discourage any of you because if, if this makes sense to you and you're comfortable with that, don't let me disparage that because of me saying I like low resistance. Because a lot of you like to treat me like a brand, like you, you know, whatever I wear, you want to wear. You know what cologne I want to wear today, you want to go out and buy it. And to me, it makes me a little uncomfortable. That's the part of this. I don't want to be a celebrity, and I don't want you to look at me like that, and especially in my trading ideas. Like, whatever I like out of my concepts, don't try to frame that as yours, because then what you're essentially doing is what I'm trying not to do with you, which is press you into a mold. If I felt that my concept only worked this way, that one particular way of doing it, I would say it only works like this. I don't do that. When I talk about price delivery, I am very dogmatic like that. That's where I am dogmatic. Because if you trade in line with how I teach how price is going to book, even retail stuff will work. Problem is, retail logic isn't going to lean on the things I'm teaching because they don't subscribe to the idea that there's something controlling price. And you know, that's an argument for another day. But at any rate, your assignment today, and we're going to close this live stream, your assignment is to go on your your trading uh, paper trading account. You should have $150,000 in your paper trading account as of right now. Do not reset. If you go over to the threshold, then it is what it is. It's fine. Log it. You're not trying to log the trades that you use to, to draw the account down. You're just trying to make the account go down. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, how can I do that? Just go in and pick, uh, do like, um, do 10 contracts. Okay. And then go in, put the trade on, let it move against you. Cause chances are you're probably going to be offside anyway. Let it move against you a couple handles and close it and keep doing that today until you get down to, uh, $3,000. So your account says 147. Now, some of you are going to say, well, I'm just going to just set it to 147. What's the point of doing that? The point is, is you see those numbers in that trade history, just like it will occur in your trading. You can't hide it. If it's in your live account or if you're funded account, you, you can't hide those things. So you have to be accepting the fact that that's going to happen to you eventually. It will, it will be real drawdown. So you have to do what? You have to get comfortable with seeing it, number one, not being afraid of it. And then now you have a task of recuperating from it. How do you get it back? You spend the rest of this week doing it. So your instructions are to create a pseudo, here's your consequent encouragement, and the next level would be here. 
So now because we hit that level, you want to see does the dollar have that lower low? I haven't looked yet. I think talking to you. It did not make that lower low. So we went through the consequent encroachment, as I said, and I said we would probably have a higher low as we have. And then do we consolidate here for the rest of the morning going into lunch? That's what I would subscribe to. I'm not saying that that's what you should trade on, but that's how I would view this morning. Why? Because the dollar has not made that higher high here in the ES with a lower low. It hasn't met a lower low on dollar. So in other words, we're higher on this low than that one. In a perfectly symmetrical market, the dollar should be on a lower low. It's not. We have a higher high in ES that should be met with a lower low in dollar. It's not. So that means when you ever, whenever you see that, this would completely close my trade entirely. I wouldn't have anything else. So remember I was saying earlier that at that time when we hit the 47.7 level, we already have potentially a partial taken. Then 80% of the trade would come off here. Meaning what? We had 20% remaining. So because the dollar index has failed to make that lower low here, we're long in the tooth in the morning, so we're going into the 11 o'clock hour. I would be comfortable taking the trade off here. And even if it went to the 4084 level, I don't care. I don't care. And you want to be conditioned so that way you don't care either. Why shouldn't you care? Because you would have taken along from here or the order block, as I outlined, down close candles should start what? Supporting price. Down close candle, supported price. Rally's up with the dollar going lower. Everything is on, everything being equal rather. When we get to the 4077 level, 80% of the trade comes off. Why? Because it still could see weakness on dollar and we can trade up in a consequent encroachment. If it gets the consequent encroachment with a higher low, that's a green light for me to say, okay, I'm done. Now, if we didn't have the, the Fed chairman tomorrow and Wednesday, I wouldn't take 80% off of here. I would take 50% off and I would take another 25% here, leaving a balance of 25% of the position that would have been occurred here or down here. So I'm giving you a lot of theory as to you know how I internalize price where I take partials, why I subscribe to submitting to price a certain way, and what am I submitting to? What am I evaluating throughout the process of price moving? I'm, I've walked you through it this morning. So hopefully, if you found this one insightful, you'll give the video a thumbs up. It doesn't cost you anything to do that. But if you don't, that's fine too. It's, I'm still going to be here doing it. <laughs> but it's just a way of, uh, you know, that's your way of applause that you got something that was useful from it. Uh, thumbs down. I really don't care. I don't really see them, but I get a few of them. But if, it was, if this was useful information to you, if you watched it unfold live here, and it wasn't with live data, obviously. Um, you know, thumbs up or a comment on Twitter with some feedback. You guys are welcome to do that. I just want to check one real quick with the US versus the, I'm sorry, US 500 versus the um, ES chart. Got wrapped up in my discussion. I wanted to toggle back to this, I apologize. It's a work in progress. I'm sure I'll be better at this as we go further into the year, but you can still see the same thing occurring relative to what we're talking. The left chart is ES futures contract. That down close candle, supporting price, down close candle, supporting price. So you still see the same thing, the same elements are there, and then the delivery on the upside. So uh, the question, and this is the last thing I'm, I'm gonna close in this session now. There are folks that are saying, well, we don't see the new week opening gaps, you know, for the CFD, which is the US 500 or US 100, US 30 if you're trading them. Uh, I don't trade these, but you want to refer to where price has the new week opening gaps on the futures contract. Even if you are using it with delayed data, it doesn't matter. When price is trading near those new week opening gaps or they're being utilized as a draw for liquidity, where price was trading comparably in the ES chart when it was trading at the new week opening gap here, that's how you would do it. So what do I mean by that? Let's go into the new week opening gap chart and then I'm done. My voice is really, really <laughs> streaming. So the new week opening gap that we were outlining here, 
notice how it's coming off that consequent encroachment. Pretty interesting. Image. When we go back to where this was formed, let's go to a 16 minute chart. Okay, so here's the here's the, the day, which is uh, in January, January 27th to the 29th. Okay, so Friday 27th of January, the closing price on that Friday is what this is here. And then the opening price on Sunday, January 30th, I'm sorry, January 29th. Okay, that's what I'm showing here. Okay, so here's Friday, closing price, regular trading hours, and then the opening price on Sunday. See that? So what you would do is you would use those very specific candles on US 500 and use their respective opening and closing, you know, it's Friday's closing price and the opening price there. So that way you're calibrating to US 500. It's not going to be perfect, folks, and that's the reason why I counsel all of you to try to do whatever you can to get the data for US futures. Even if you can't trade them, the data itself is useful because you're, you're going to be following the logic that I'm teaching you. And the CFD is going to follow what the futures contract is doing. The futures contract is not referring to the US 500 and trying to keep up with it. It's, that's not happening. Okay, The CFD is trying to keep up with what this market's doing. So your data needs to be derived from this, not that of the US 500 or US 100 CFD. So if you're just trading the CFD and you're not ever referring to the actual futures contract price, you're playing with a, you know, well, <laughs> you, you, you're trading blindfolded. You don't, you don't have all the details that you need, especially if you're trying to be precise and detail oriented. So at any rate, again, I'm going to close this one here. And hopefully you guys have benefited from this morning. Hopefully you've learned something. And until next time, be safe.